Is echt hier.
Is that okay? All right, welcome everyone at Nature, the key to future-proofing your buildings. Welcome everyone here live at the Provada 2022, but also dialing in at home uh, digitally because this is also a webinar. Um, so know that we are recording this as well. Uh, again, a warm welcome. Today we're going to discuss what the role of nature in real estate industry is from the part that how it impacts how we build, engineer, experience, but also the financial side, uh, our buildings. Um, and to structure this very broad topic, we've determined uh, three themes that together with these three uh, speakers we will uh, discover. The first is politics of nature. So we see that regulations are actually impacting and changing and demanding more and more from buildings. At the same time, the public also has a very strong opinion on this. So how to deal with this in this uh, day and age? The second theme is nature by design. So how can we actually look at our designs differently and from the start incorporate nature and can it help us create buildings that can adapt with climate change? And the final topic is the long-term value of nature. So at the moment, often we look at buildings as they are de uh, delivered, but how do we look at sustainable innovation over the operational period? And to guide our topic here, or our discussion here, we've invited three great speakers. We have Charlotte Givioun, architect, director of MVSA. We have André Lagosch, solution architect at Fizi, and Sander van den Heuvel, head of acquisition at Roundhill Capital. During this conversation, each topic will be addressed 10 minutes, during which I can imagine that you might have some questions. We'll look if we can, can get them in during those 10 minutes per topic, but otherwise save them for the end and then we'll give the floor to you. If then still there's not enough time, we will have drinks at four o'clock at our cocktail party, so just approach us directly. And now to kick things off with the first topic, politics of nature. So, politics of nature. Um, Sander, to start this discussion, I have a statement for you and I'm curious how, how you'll respond. Complying with regulations is not enough to set yourself apart in the current real estate market. Companies should be leading from their own vision on ESGs to attract funds, tenants, and remain relevant. What would you say? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think a, a bigger theme in the Netherlands driven by local regulation is that we are building uh, to re very high sustainability levels already. Um, it's one of the highest in Europe, what we're seeing. Um, however, uh, that's, that's on the environmental part. And we're feeling that pain and we're struggling how to build bank compliant and how to design uh, bank compliant. But there is, on top of those regulations, which are on, driven by government or local municipalities, there are also other things ongoing globally where 
uh, the big global investors are just demanding and pushing on higher ESG standards for local investors, for their partners, for uh, buildings they're buying. And that, that we feel less in the Netherlands currently because we are so much focused on applying with those already high regulation. Um, that means that the, the S and the G part within ESG are relatively undervalued in the Netherlands and we don't pay too much attention to it. And that's something I, I do expect to change, that we need to do one step more, especially on that S and that G within the ESG part. Mm -hmm. And I think um, um, technology will play, will play a, a crucial part in doing so. So how, how better to solve something we cannot do on social part to uh, have tenants within a building, building interact better via an app or via a community yeah. program. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is something on top of the tough situation we're relatively in, uh, something I definitely expect. Yeah. Charlotte, any thoughts on that? Do you also see these changes? I do see these changes. You see a lot of startups at the moment uh, focusing especially all, also on the social component. Um, a lot of big scale housing projects that are um, currently being developed have apps uh, or maybe even two types of social groups. Um, people with disabilities uh, who live together with uh, within a community home. Um, yeah. The, so I, I, de I definitely see that part and the E as well, but that, that will come, I think, with time eventually, but uh, a bit less at the moment. And maybe, maybe to that point, the, the, the part around governance is always difficult, more difficult to grab. What can you do better using technology to improve your governance? Mm -hmm. I think a part with your building management system that, for example, VZ has, uh, but we, we see across other PropTech startups as well, is, is definitely something that can help them. And um, for Roundhill Capital, do you uh, have a certain vision then that you look to, uh, to implement in the coming years where you see this change happening to move ahead of the market? Uh, yes, for sure. We, we are next to a real estate investor, also a prop tech investor. We've set up our own Roundhill Ventures Fund um, where we do invest in those prop tech startups. And what we aim to do is uh, when we invest in those startups, we aim to help them with our expertise on the, on the residential or, uh, and the real estate side of things. But we also try to test those concepts within our assets and, and in our own backyard, so to speak. So we try to help them grow and, and, and also make our performance of our assets better. Sometimes by experimenting, but, but definitely um, to the better cause of improving ESG. Yeah. And, and to trigger a little bit, is experimenting, is that actually implementing it on large scale or is it in test environments? It's um, more in test environments than large scale and it depends on how far um, the company has developed its products that, that we are investing in. Um, but in principle, both. If something works, we aim to roll that out across the, uh, the five billion of assets we manage in Europe. So. Clear, thanks. And um, then maybe a question uh, to you, Andrilla, because you, uh, you on a daily basis look at how can we implement technology, also from a political uh, point of view. So what would you say, which effects or, uh, of sustainable innovation are currently missed uh, by regulations? Yeah, so uh, when we look into technical uh, state of the art technologies or facade innovations, technological innovations, what happens is um, they are so far ahead. Um, yeah, regulations, are, they don't manage to actually fully encompass the capabilities of this because they're all technology push uh, uh, companies. So that we do see a limitation there because, say for example, then it does look into monthly calculations. Uh, it does monthly calculations to understand if there is energy savings or not, or like what kind of energy consumption a building has. But then there are so many different uh, state-of-the-art technologies which is like really get gathering data and then using that data to either control or provide insights and provide energy savings. And those things cannot be really simulated using a monthly calculation. All those small, small energy savings that you have or any kind of uh, benefits that you're having are not really fully encompassed. And sometimes it does happen that, uh, and, yeah, and that's where the limitation comes in. And the thing is, from then uh, comes Priam or like every other certifications yeah. are actually also dependent upon regulations. So it flows into the others. Yeah, and exactly. 
can you could put some sort of number on this? So like, what what are we missing with respect to impact? Is it ten percent, twenty percent of some? Yeah, yeah. So totally, when we see if you have a standard, I would say uh, if you do an LG evaluation mm -hmm. and say it has it maybe having fifty five kilowatt hours per meter square kind of a, a primary energy consumption uh, mm -hmm. or demand uh, for that building. Then, with the help of state-of-the-art technologies, you can actually increase it by 10, 12 percent on an average, okay. and that is completely missed. And that would have actually given you a more nearly zero-energy building or a Paris proof label. But you cannot ask for it because mm -hmm. standard regulations cannot encompass that. Yeah. So, then for you, Sander, what needs to change so that we can actually incorporate the true value of uh, uh, of nature? It is also knowing what's what's out there and what are the possible solutions that you can implement, and seeing the effects, seeing the effects of all the uh, options out there on how it can help you on on the different parts of, of the building you're going to manage or you're going to own or you're going to um, uh, work on. So we we would I personally would like to have more visibility on the options available and and kind of maybe doing that again on a different platform, but hopefully that will allow parties to, to try out more things in their assets that they're developing or that they're owning. And sometimes some may not work again, but, but being on, this, on, the, on your front feet in, in terms of innovation is really important, uh, especially when we know what's coming our head uh, in terms of regulation and, and what we can still expect in five to 10 years. Yeah, and. Um with that uh, being said, so you said that regulation is changing. And we actually see that in office buildings, coming year, the first step towards a label C is happening. Then it's going to continue to label label A. Is that something you take into account for the business case of projects right now? And if so, how? Um, y yes, we are doing that. We are building, of course, to the standards today. If we can do better, uh, we will but not at any cost, and that's the difficult part. So how can you be ahead of what's coming next and still have, a, have an investment case? That's the tricky part. And for that, we need, we need to have um, some evidence or some reliance on, on um, energy savings we can apply by using a certain construction technique or using a certain uh, building management system. Or that is, that is really important to see. But also to believe in and, ju and just say, okay, we, we're we're in this together, and, and we're gonna, with our partners we work with, implement those technology options in our buildings, mm -hmm. and we just assume because that's where, what we currently think is our best guess, we're gonna save 20% on energy going forward, and on that basis you can you can also assess the impact on valuation, and we do see a lot of parties in the market struggling with this, yeah. so if the 20% also to your point on, on certification, if the 20% isn't yet evidenced it's really hard to take into account by, by parties generally in the market. Yeah, yeah. and I also, th yeah. I also think like when we look into these kind of technologies, it's not always just about energy, right? And uh, we always face this issue that these are some of these savings are operational savings as well, or then we are looking into uh, comfort, which is kind of harder to quantify, mm -hmm. but then we know that it does affect productivity. It does mm -hmm. in the end would help uh, improve uh, uh, as a tenant, for, from the tenant's perspective, will give them uh, uh, benefits or profits uh, through making their uh, uh, employees more productive, but it's harder to uh, mm -hmm. quantify it and people want to make a business case out of it. And it exactly. just becomes <laughs> harder uh, every day. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to cut you off here. Yeah. I know we can talk a lot longer on this stuff, but we've actually reached the end of the 10 minutes. Okay. And um, if there are, again, if there are questions, please keep them in mind. We're going to have drinks later. You can ask them directly to them, or at the end, we'll get some time. But now on to the next subject, nature by design. Yes. Charlotte, a statement for you. Um, buildings are often seen as static objects, and as such, not capable of adapting to changing weather and climate conditions. The most re efficient buildings, however, now, are, the most efficient buildings now and in the future are dynamic and work with nature. 
Yeah, I fully agree with that statement. Yeah. Um, we are currently uh, incorporating more and more green in our buildings. Uh, one of the examples actually is Wonderwoods. I, I don't know if everybody knows it, but it's a project we're currently developing in Utrecht. Um, it's, uh, it's right in the middle of the city center, um, and we're actually building a hectare of forest on a building there, together with Stefano Bray Architects. And um, the nice thing about the project is, is that, that it's not only about enjoying nature for the people who live there, it also helps a lot with energy savings. We're 65% uh, down on energy consumption, uh, but we also provide uh, 15,000 kilo uh, grams um, of oxygen every uh, single year and also adapt a, a lot of CO2 of course um, so that that the incorporation of green uh, is not only a thing that we um, is it, it's not only nice to have I think it's a must have so nature it will stay a part of our city it will stay a part of our uh, daily life um, to have a place for everything that flies around us, um, I think it's it's very important. And then to come a little bit back on what we just discussed, was all, was all this based on needs from regulation or? No, this was not based uh, uh, on regulation at all. Actually, the only thing uh, the only thing we had was that the city said, "This is the urban health quarter. Give us a healthy building." And a is so <laughs> that could be everything, but a healthy building for. Um, so we we decided to make a healthy building not only for people but also for the city, also for for the world in that sense um, and the animals around it. It hosts 35 species, um, everything from birds to bees. Um, so it's actually fully incorporated uh, nature project in that sense. Yeah, and, and so you say it's a healthier building. What makes it so healthy other than the word nature? Well, um, well, it makes it a healthy building. It's also well, uh, well platinum labeled, so um, it is also a proven, uh, uh, proven, um, well, uh, sufficient building. Um, we, of course, don't know the data yet if it really is as healthy as we expect it to be. Um, but we have some data from our own office because we built um, the flow in the Houthavens and currently we are uh, assessing that building and all the technologies inside together with um, the University of Lausanne. Um, and they're actually me they're measuring um, our oxygen levels, our CO2 levels, uh, warmth, um, uh, but also the social aspect like do people like to work here is it is it nice is it better than our old office because they also measured our old office so um, at the end of this year we expect to have some sort of a benchmark at least to see if all those well uh, platinum uh, features with healthy food and healthy living actually uh, helped right. Andrella could you because yeah. you work on this on yeah I, I would really like to add on to this because I think what she mentioned with making it green and having a green forest in the middle, it really helps because we have seen through research that when you have views to the outdoors, we are basically an outdoor animal, but we end up spending 95% of our time indoors. And therefore, being able to have these kind of green trees and nature outside, right in the middle of the building, and being able to see that on a daily basis, you really, really improve productivity and health of the occupants you don't again it's again a something unquantifiable in a way but through benchmarking studies we have already seen that it reduces sick leaves by at least 3.5 days per yep. year per employee huge benefit you improve uh, there are no glare instances or uh, with that you have better healthier air inside so i'm pretty sure when you're measuring we uh, are, Dawson yeah. already sees that they have better healthier environment inside the added benefit or um, in addition to all of these pointers with this urban core forest is the fact that you can already, uh, if you make it dynamic, then of course, then you're really starting to interact not only with the green and the nature inside of the atrium or the court, but then you're also interacting with the environment and then you allow better sunlight to come in or you're controlling the light and, and people are much more happier. If you have better daylight, you're letter, lesser sick you have on a median productivity level basis 3.5% 3, 3 lesser productivity loss. That was also a survey done by Carnegie Mellon. So there are quantified research that says that making green buildings will in the end make people healthier. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it's still in a research. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's also, and and not only green, it's also using nature and how nature designs exactly. certain things, which is quite interesting. For example, um, if you look at plants or flowers, how how their structure works, for for example. We use that in um, in two of our buildings, uh, Holland Casino Venlo, uh, where we actually use the, the same structure as a flower does to collect water. And the leaves we use uh, to collect um, uh, solar energy uh, via PV, which is actually the, the same thing as how nature works. So looking at nature and incorporating that um, using parametric design and seeing where the sunlight comes from, how do you shape your building um, like a sunflower does turning towards the daylight. Um, yeah, I think that could be next steps we will see in, in yeah. uh, design of buildings. Yeah, and even uh, to add to that, we already see facade technologies where we yeah. have PV panels that turn, starting to actually orient accordingly yeah. to yeah. the sun, just like a sunflower. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Sense also has it. Yeah. <laughs> It starts tracking the sun. Exactly. But so it's, it's really, yeah, true. Yeah. I agree to you. It, it, I have to say, like, it, it sounds like a beautiful uh, picture, but it also can, I can imagine that it requires a different approach in developing and designing buildings. Yes. Does yeah, you yeah. work uh, with ecologists actually from the start of the project. Um, you also work with the people who need to uh, make sure that all the green stays green because you see a lot of green buildings that are greenwashed, but will they look green in the future as well? Like yeah. our statement is, is that we make gardens, we make a forest that will stay that way yeah. um, and it will help the city of Utrecht. So if you make that statement, you should um, really mm -hmm. focus on how you make it as well. Yeah. And does that mean also a different role for the investor? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know a lot <laughs> about that, I think. But yeah. It, it, when you look at the Wonder Woods building, for example, I can imagine if you look at it purely from a spreadsheet valuation perspective that all the gardening, all the, the water costs for those, those um, trees will, will cost, right? Yeah. So down the line, the, 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 the cash coming out of your investment will be lower. Yeah. If you then get happier tenants, you get a better climate, you get a better social um, feeling within that building, and it helps on all the other fronts. It's literally an investment into the well-being of um, tenants within that building and people using the building and coming home and, and smiling when they open their windows because they see trees rather than mm -hmm. concrete. So, yeah. yes, it, it for sure requires a different um, mm -hmm. approach, and I think they've they found a, a good partner there who can take a view on that valuation and say we'll accept a bit of a lower yield but we'll get a way better building so uh, mm. those partners are needed for for definitely such, yeah, for such sure. innovations mm -hmm. yeah and and also be because of the statement and the statement we have with the well platinum um, we also see that uh, getting tenants for the building is easier because also large multinationals, they want healthy buildings, uh, people, mm -hmm. you want your workers to be happy. So um, you can also ask for higher rent. So that's a bit of the business case. Um, yeah. And do you see that uh, happening, Sander, that indeed tenants are looking more at this topic than before? Yes, um, I think regulations apply to um, investors, to developers, and also to tenants, especially for the bigger corporates who want to have um, be ESG compliant to again their investors who may be listed somewhere or, or, or other big firms. Mm -hmm. So this push is going across all the mm -hmm. stakeholders within the sector. So definitely also the tenants, they are mm -hmm. just demanding a better and more healthy building than, than way more than they did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we see that it's almost a precondition to mm -hmm. get a good high quality tenant uh, to rent in your mm -hmm. building. So from that perspective, it really looks like the time is right for really incorporating and looking differently at, at buildings. Um, we've entered literally uh, the final minute, maybe a final statement, Charlotte. What, what needs to change uh, to really open up all possibilities? Well, what needs to change a lot? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if we stay in dialogue also with our investors, I think yeah. that that's the best thing we can have because yeah. uh, you need each other to make things happen. Uh, so let's please keep nature in the foreground of our minds when we all design uh, or build. I yeah. think that's our main uh, would be should be our main goal. Let's make that happen. All right. So that's the end of the second topic. Uh, again, we could have continued talking, but we're on to the third and final, the the long term value of nature. All right, 
Andrella, this time for you a statement. Um, the current market focuses a lot on development costs rather than the operational costs and the footprint of buildings. This needs to change to actually make our industry sustainable. Yeah, so one thing that we already know or we talk about a lot is we say that the building and the construction industry is responsible for 40% of the carbon emissions, right? So out of that 40%, 28% is actually operational carbon emissions and expenses. And typically, as you were mentioning, yeah, we really do see that with uh, typically with certifications or regulations, we do everything to deliver a sustainable or energy efficient building. But the post occupancy evaluation and really looking how what we have designed is actually performing up to the standards or not, or what are the faults that are actually coming up are not really taken into account. And when we actually start taking that into account and really start monitoring and controlling the operational part, then we can actually start addressing this huge 28% out of the portal, right? So, yeah, I do see that it's uh, really, really important, and this is where a lot of these new technology company comes in because in general also construction is a low tech company uh, yeah. low tech industry, industry. and you now you are really seeing a lot of uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of sensing coming in sensing in, in building in the building construction industry you you have so much of data and you can actually on an operation phase start utilizing the data to reduce and uh, make your building much more energy efficient yeah so it's really up to the industry to really embrace it and yeah. let uh, data do its work. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm curious how for you, Sander, this is because... Yeah. In theory, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Practice is that we're today in a, in, a, in a tough environment and with construction costs up, I don't know, 40, 50 percent versus a couple of years ago. So, placing myself in, in the shoes of a, a developer, why do I need to invest more? Whereas, whereas mm -hmm. building a, a, developing a profitable building today is already difficult. Yeah. So, and I think not only putting the statement out there, but but also looking at what you need to to have that appreciated in the value today is is probably a bit of proven concept that you can clearly state what we're implementing today in terms of technology costs a hundred and will save ten per year, yeah. um, and. And that may be, well, not 100% right, but that if that is the uh, technology, um, if it's about technology you're, 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 you're using, if that's the belief that the technology business has, then let's embrace that and let's go with that by lack of something better. But at least it doesn't get you caught in that squeeze of we don't know. And that's, we don't know phase is, is just really tough to break through. Yeah. And to get to a level of proven technology, you of course have to implement it. What are ways that, well, you mentioned you're doing prop tech investments. Um, are there platforms to prove technology or are there ways to move from this situation? There are for sure um, and, and they, they usually take a bit of time to prove. So mm -hmm. as long as those companies keep kind of growing and developing and continuing their business, then that proof will, will come if all goes well by itself. Um, yeah, I think I think we as Roundhill were investors into prop tech, as I said, and we have multiple of those examples where things just by by sticking to the concept and believing in the concept and s staying in there as an investor and and helping them to develop, you can grow the business towards something more established and, and proven. Yeah. And is this for you, uh, Charlotte, where an architect can also really add in in bringing in innovation? from your role in bringing, like integrating a, a complete concept? Um, yep, what we, to, to elaborate a bit, also a bit on what Sander says, what we mainly see is that there's a very big difference between developers who develop for themselves as an investment or developers that develop for um, yeah, private equity, uh, for example, or for, for the open market, I must say. Um, the, the ones that develop for themselves are more likely to uh, appreciate technology in an early stage uh, and um, then we can incorporate it a lot of the times already in a in preliminary design and uh, which also helps us um, to prove um, 
in theory and in practice that uh, actually the, the, the energy consumption or the energy savings will go down by a certain amount. Um, and then they won't get cut because of budget cuts at the end. Um, but if you develop for uh, a static developer, then uh, a lot of the times they don't really see because the investor doesn't ask for it or they don't know yet what the ex added value is. So I, th I think that's something that needs to change, but mm -hmm. that will come once there's more proven practice from the other benchmarks, I expect, because then larger investment companies will push it down into the chain. And once that happens, um, we will have the freedom to incorporate it from the beginning. Yeah. So maybe it needs to become more of a regime and also the fact it we also again it kind of comes back to the first topic that you were talking about like really nudging the certifications and regulations to also standardize it a bit more or at least open the conversation to allow for these kind of technological innovations so that people are or developers who, who don't want to innovate has to innovate mm -hmm. and then adopt such technologies rather than be only depending upon uh, visionary investors and architects who believe in it solely and make it a part of their whole design process. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Does, does that mean more regulation? <laughs> no, uh, more open-minded regulation, I would say, or more change in the landscape context. So it would, again, I believe the whole landscape, con landscape context of tenants wanting more out of a building would mm -hmm. allow and with climate change happening, there's already we see with Paris Group, it's, they really put a really hard label and then people are tr trying to achieve that. So these kind of landscape contexts uh, should urge companies or uh, sorry, regulations to also change and mm -hmm. modify. And it's, it seems like a two-pronged process where not only the industry in itself pushes it through uh, uh, self-motivated investors and developers, but also from the regulation side, so the people who are not considering, who are not the technology pushers, uh, catch on to the regime just to be able to comply and abide by it. So, in fact, more flexible or more open uh, certification yeah. may be leading to, to the same, maybe, GRESP label, for example. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So for, for reaching rest of labor, I think right now yeah. it's all about BREEAM, right? Yeah. So maybe yeah. other smart building certifications should be starting to get considered so yeah. that all the other aspects of uh, smart technology that can really help with not only energy savings or uh, development cost or increasing your rent premium, um, yeah, can yeah. become more mainstream and then people adopt it better. Yeah. So open-mindedness open -mindedness and uh, educating the I market. think generally that is best. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and, but isn't the industry then open-minded? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I, think the, I think the building industry is very old school. Yeah. So they're open-minded, but everything is done in a certain way. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot to achieve there. Yeah. <laughs> And, and who has the ball there? Who can, who can make that change? I think everybody on their own, like, I, mm -hmm. I think you can make change, like we can push it as architects to go build modular, more wood, biodiverse. Um, we can push it from that, that side, but I also think that contractors should push themselves to become uh, more innovative as well. We have a uh, NOx2 problem, as everybody knows. Um, I think um, all electric building sites, for example, could also happen. That's not my expertise, but I think there's a lot of opportunities in all kinds of different ways uh, where everybody can be innovative in their own field. Yeah. Maybe a response to that from uh, the investor side? I, I fully agree, and it's, it's embrace the technology as a sector and, and do more and, and um, have more kind of out there what the options are as in for the architect, for the developer, for the investor, and, and how it ca how it likely helps you, um, and that uh, embracing I don't see yet sufficiently going on, and uh, I would love to see more. I couldn't agree more, Sander. Let's embrace the technology <laughs> and look look to the future with more sustainable buildings. Uh, thank you. For, can I first get an applause for our, our speakers? Uh, thank you very much.
Yeah, we're in the final dying seconds, but we're going into the question round. So, does anybody have a question for these three regarding either of the topics we've just discussed? Of course. Well, I think it's my courtesy to uh, kick off. Uh, um, Charlotte or Sander, have you ever experienced, I'm trying to find you are already expert in it, but uh, have you ever experienced someone already push, slamming on the table? Oh, have you already experienced someone slamming on the table and saying, okay, now we're going to do it differently? Like really demanding in it, whether it's an architect or whether it's an investor, just saying, okay, guys, let's just cut the crap. We're all trying to make a good building. Let's really do it now in this way instead of the regular way. Have you ever experienced that out there? Uh, very honest, no. It's, um, we have this push internally, so I can say, honestly, my CEO is doing so. So we really embrace this, really go for technology. Um, in the market, in, in discussions around a new building, not really. Um, a lot of people, are, again, are happy when you just get a good um, building that complies with all the local reg regulations, but not somebody slamming on the table saying, go all the way and why don't we do more? It's uh, unfortunately no. Unfortunately no as well. <laughs> well we, we try, but that's more as designers amongst, like as a group, and that we try in tenders to push ourselves as far as we can go. But that's not always received in that way by uh, the, the, the party on the other side. And that could easy, easily be the city, because it's a, a new concept that's not been proven and that they cannot check the box. Or uh, the other way around, that the investment is too large or... Uh, the, I do think you see more and more efforts popping up around us and there's more developers wanting more from a building. Um, but uh, to say that somebody says, let's go off grid with our building, for example, we tried that a couple of months ago um, because of the shortage of power here in Amsterdam. We said, let's just make a off grid building. But everybody's too scared. So it, it, yeah, well, maybe after today. <laughs> And uh, if they're too scared, what are, what are they scared for? Regulations also. Like, uh, we, and backup. We need a backup plan. Is it possible? And then falling back into old school things. Yeah. So, static and uh, old school things. Yes. Um, anybody else wondering a question? Yours? Right, uh, Sander, you mentioned at some point that it's difficult to express in an Excel sheet what the added value would be of uh, well, less employee leave due to sickness and, and stuff like that. Um, do you think if, if well, those venues would be chased, uh, you'd be you'd be welcoming that um, option to, to, to put it more in more monetary terms, uh, those 3.5 percent or 3.5 days you mentioned. Would you welcome that change in the beginning of your um, well, Excel phase of the investment? Uh, yes, ver very much. That's, that really is a very, um, ob say, say objective uh, metric by which you quantify your investment. So if I develop this, my cash flow is 10 and it's worth 100, the building. So if that, if that cash flow is 11, the building, building is worth more. So that's that's... Theoretically, yes, we would welcome that very much. It's it's about well-being of human nature and quantifying that, which is the very tough part, and and why I think the market is slow in, in accepting that. Together with this push is ongoing for 10, 15 years, but but there's not so much people that have worked probably in a fully green um, nature uh, design building. So how can we really um, convince ourselves and convince the market of that? that metric really being out there. And that's, I think, the, the, the catch uh, 22 that we're in. And it's really hard, to be honest, to break that. Because if I then believe in it and I get a valuation from an external party who doesn't, I'll get proven wrong by, by investors or whoever, who, who, the buyer of the building maybe. So that's, that's something, to, to Charlotte's point, it's very important. If it's 
somebody who's developing to hold the building for longer periods. He said, yeah, I just believe in that and I'll see if, if it comes out. And that's the way you can get to prove those concepts. And that's easier. But when there's too much external parties coming to play and having an, an opinion in an already traditional market, that's where we first need to convince a lot of people before really being able to, to properly implement it. I have a follow-up question. Uh, so do you think if we invest more in research for these kind of post occupancy uh, evaluations that can help with these numbers for, so that you can get a better net present value for your building? Uh, um, so is it something that you consider as a solution to actually invest more in research because then you do have institutions actually validating things uh, for you and that cannot be necessarily disputed by third parties who evaluate your I, I think that's very important, yes. So, and it's more like targeted research to, to solving a specific issue, which could be valuation, which could be just m measuring well-being. I think it's really important. And to your point on data earlier, yeah, that's, that's I think, where it starts. Collecting the data and evidencing that it is it and, does exist. And, and do you see companies or investors or like other companies as well investing uh, more in these kind of like these kind of studies or, or, or the investment in terms of research typically goes elsewhere? Uh, no, I, I think so. I think all asset managers today are more data driven than they were 10 years ago. So everybody wants that data, wants to control it and be able to look at the impact of something they're, they're doing on their building. And, and, and kind of that slow progression of being more data driven as a sector will help us there in my view. And also to make better buildings afterwards, because if you have the building built, you have the data out, it helps us at, for a start um, to design a better building in the beginning. Because if you see how flows go in the building, which areas are used more often, where does it heat up, where, does it, where, where do you have problems in the building, it, it gives us a new benchmark to start designing better. So, so I think it's like a data will become like a circle um, Evolving our, our yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then also probably there will be more disruptive technologies coming in yes. to even further push uh, the field to be operationally later on more uh, uh, successful in saving energy. Exactly. But do you also see? Do you foresee? Because I feel now people have data and they also keep the data to themselves. Yeah, we have. For example, we did a transformation uh, building for uh, the the Ministry of Finance, which is old, it's years ago, I think 10 years ago delivered. Um, and we know that um, there's a lot less sick leave since we delivered the building. And for 10 years, I'm trying to pry out the data, but they're not giving it. Because they think like people will say like, oh, everybody was sitting at home and now they're all healthy because the building, but for us, it is a thing to, for example, convince Sander to make um, to make an investment because we can show them that it improved by X percent and very interesting. Sander, are these also arguments that tenants listen to? Potential tenants? Yes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah very important arguments. That's all about giving, for an office building, giving your employees a place where they can work safely and be healthy and, and everybody wants their employees to be healthy, right? So. Yeah. Yes, very much, and, and such data would definitely help. So maybe you would even think of a, a, a platform where this data gets shared. Yeah, exactly. Maybe on an anonymous basis that you don't need to say, my company has a sick leave of X. That's maybe sensitive, Th but yeah. when you can benchmark that in a similar way that InRef does on, on just returns, you can also benchmark this, which, exactly. which is going to be more and more important. That's a very good point. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent, excellent uh, initiative. Ah, right? And um, yeah, thank you for this final conversation. Um, to everyone here, thank you for coming again, also dialing in digitally. Um, all, if you have further questions, keep them in mind. These people are here. We're going to have a cocktail party right now. I want to invite you all to come over and pick it up. And thank you again for coming. Give, give these three a warm applause. And we have some gifts before you leave.
I repeat. Yeah? All right. I repeat. The bar is opened.